Okay, we've got a lot to cover. Good morning. Um, I assume for most of you it's good morning, but perhaps if you're uh, coming zooming in from afar, it might be afternoon or evening. But I appreciate uh, all of you taking the time to uh, take a little leap into ocean optics. I'll give you just a short background on me. Again, um, Eric Ream. Uh, I am senior optical oceanographer at Seabird Scientific. And I've been an oceanographer since about 2004. Uh, it, oceanography came to me uh, mid-career. I spent 25 years originally trained as an electrical engineer, but doing software engineering with my last stint being in Hollywood, almost literally uh, working on color grading for films as film was scanned, digitized, and then its exposure, just like we use with Photoshop, adjusted, but in this case, frame by frame for 24 frames a second for a movie film. So I was working with color, and when I decided to go into ocean oceanography, uh, it took me a while to find my place uh, before I made the leap, and ocean optics was it, because as you can see in the photo here, um, although this is you know, a crashing wave, the ocean does have color, and that's because we have a sun, which is roughly broad spectrum, and we have constituents in the water, the water molecules itself, but constituents in the water that give us the color. And we have instruments that are uniquely designed across the range of understanding those constituents um, to uh, essentially quantify them. And that's to me what science is all about. So what we're gonna cover some basic concepts of the instruments that we have, ocean color and spectral absorption. Uh, as promised in the uh, abstract uh, optical theory, A plus B equals C, there'll be some algebra and some math here, but it, it's not higher math. Um, I'll go through it fairly quickly, but you'll be able to have the slides and you can walk yourself through it. I'll show you uh, while we're going through it, some hints that you can use later on if you need to go through it a little bit more slowly. And then we'll look at um, three of our instruments that measure what are called inherent optical properties. Then we'll take a look at fluorometry and radiometry measuring light itself. So let's take a look at some of the basic concepts here. And let's just start out just to plant in your mind. You don't know quite what you may or may not be familiar with these instruments, but um, I'll just go over them to start with here. We have our ACS, which measures spectral absorption and attenuation. And you'll learn what that is if that doesn't mean anything to you yet at 80 wavelengths. We have a Sea Star and an, a companion product called a Sea Rover, which is designed for uh, Argo profiling floats that measure wavelength or measure attenuation at one wavelength. And there's a tremendous amount of information you can get out of this. You've probably seen a Sea Star on a, a CTD Rosette, uh, a, sh a ship, uh, a sh uh, the Rosette with the water bottles and other seabird temperature, salinity, and conductivity. Uh, measurements, but this measures essentially how much light is transmitted in the water. So it's called a beam transmissometer, and our model names are Sea Star and Sea Rover. And then we have our Eco and Sea Owl lines, which provide us with measures of fluorescence of chlorophyll, fluorescent dissolved organic matter, and backscattering. Uh, in the radiometry area, we have three different products, one, two of which are multispectral, meaning they measure it for or seven discrete wavelengths or uh, photosynthetically available radiation, which is a broadband measurement. And, um, or we have our hyper OCR, which uses an internal spectrometer to measure at 140 wavelengths at roughly 3.3 nanometers per pixel. And we'll understand why that's important later on. So let's jump right into it. Chlorophyll and other pigments in plants. It's fall and we can see leaves starting to turn. And what's actually happening is the chlorophyll in the leaves and the chlorophyll is what gives us photosynthesis. And you can thank uh, photosynthesis on land for every other breath that you breathe and photosynthesis in the ocean for the other breath, every two breaths that you breathe. And uh, even though we don't see many plants in the ocean, sometimes in coastal areas, we see macroalgae, we don't see leaves like this. The process of photosynthesis and plants is the same. There are pigments which absorb light and then transfer that energy to chlorophyll, which in turn uh, um, does the miracle of splitting water, creating hydrogen and oxygen, as well as driving uh, essentially the synthesis of sugar and creating plant life. <clears throat> 
what we see in the fall is actually the chlorophyll degrading. So in some sense, the leaves aren't really turning, the chlorophyll is glowing away and you're getting a look at all those other pigments that are in there. So that bright red is the fact that even when there is chlorophyll, what we're seeing is reflected light. You know, So the red is being reflected back at us. It can't be being absorbed or else we wouldn't see it. So it's the other colors that are being absorbed. And we can look at this in a, in a graph format. On the bottom scale, we have wavelength of light, 400 to 700 nanometers. And you can see the typical rainbow, the uh, graph that corresponds to those wavelengths. And in the vertical axis is how much light is being absorbed per unit distance. And if we take a look at just that green, the green curve, and uh, Nicole, can they see my mouse? Yes, we can see your mouse. Okay, so I'm pointing to the chlorophyll, green chlorophyll thing. This is our miracle pigment that gives us, gives us oxygen, an oxygenated planet. But you can see that there are other pigments like chlorophyll B and carotenoids that are roughly colored by their color that essentially broaden the spectrum of absorption of light. And so we'll be coming back to this in a moment. Oops, let's move forward a little too quickly. Now, what actually happens, you know, is we have several of these pigments and they combine a little bit like finger paints to create the color of the leaf or in the case of the ocean where we have microscopic plants, the color of the ocean that we see or that satellites can sense. So that's why we have ocean color satellites. They measure the color of the ocean in ways that our eyes can't even see because they're such sensitive, um, the detectors in the ocean color satellites, but they can see very small differences in distinct, distinct wavelengths and in the future uh, uh, being launched in January as a satellite that does what's hyper, called hyperspectral light. And just, we'll, 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 know, we'll see what that means. Here are just uh, an example of vials of a phytoplankton pigment extracted in a probably acetone. Just to give you an idea, these pigments really do have different colors in terms of the color of the light that they absorb. And again, remember the color that you're seeing or is the color that is not absorbed. <laughs> so that's, that's a tricky kind of jujitsu with, uh, with absorption. We can see that um, even in nature, things are very different colors um, inhabit the same spaces. What we're looking here in the blue green is a filamentous cyanobacteria. So these are, you know, large colonies of, of cyanobacteria that create long pig, uh, uh, filaments. And in the middle of that is a single diatom, which is obviously much bigger than any single cell, but it's much smaller than any single uh, filament. These are both photosynthetic plants. Um, but they're very different colors because of the pigments that they have, just like we see again in different leaves. So let's take a look at, if we were just to measure light at one of the wavelengths along that absorption curve, we'd have one point. And that's interesting. If you measure it in many different places, you can learn a lot about the water, but you can think of that as the Crayola one pack of crayons. And then you might move up and get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the Crayola eight pack, and you can now measure light at you know six to eight wavelengths, and um, you can see how come this is the same picture that we saw before with spectral absorption of different pigments. You can see chlorophyll A here, but B, C, carotenoids, phycocyanin, which is in cyanobacteria, phycoerythrin, which is in certain um, uh, photosynthetic bacteria, the most numerous probably microbe on the planet and chlorophyll A again with its second absorption curve around 665. And you can see there's a lot of complexity in that spectrum to capture that complexity. You really need lots of points. So that's why we would like to go to the Crayola 127 pack where we can really fill in that curve. And that is the future of ocean optics. And we have instruments that help us understand that, validate those ocean color satellites that are to just as we speak, moving from the Crayola seven or eight pack to the Crayola you know, 100 pack. And that's what we call multispectral on the left, hyperspectral on the right. So just use that sort of Crayola analogy when you ever you hear hyperspectral. There's nothing special about hyperspectral other than there's just a lot of crayons. <laughs> 
So let's jump into optical theory. And what we're gonna do is go through some algebra, but you're gonna see why A plus B equals C. There's gonna be some Greek letters, but I'll walk you through it. Let's uh, do a little background. Uh, on the right, just take a look at the picture to the right. And what we wanna do is measure absorption and scattering of light. Because obviously, if we're going to see any light, some of it has to come from the light source and come back to our eye. Or if it's the case of a remote sensor, like in the upper right, some of that light has to enter the ocean, interact with the ocean, and come back, or perhaps interact with the surface. So you can see that there are several different paths that light can take to a remote sensor, which is equivalent to several different paths that it can take to our eye. It can reflect at the surface. It can be absorbed in the water. It can be scattered back to the surface. It can be scattered down to the bottom where if it's a shallow bottom, it might be, some of it might actually be reflected. Um, the photons or the light that comes from the sun obviously goes through our atmosphere twice. If it's gonna go to a remote sensing satellite, it goes through the atmosphere once into the water, interacts with the water, some of the light, actually very little of it, but enough, and gets interacts with the atmosphere. And that's kind of a big problem in ocean color satellites is try to remove or understand what the atmosphere is doing. I won't cover that here, but um, that's, that's what keeps a lot of remote sensing people busy. But the, ma the main takeaway here is that when we're talking about the instruments that we're uh, gonna talk about today, we're talking about instruments in the water that take a look at the absorption of light, scattering of light, and, uh, and the scattering of light. So here's the as promised picture showing um, several things. And the most important thing here is to show that we have incident light, that's what the subscript I is, and we're starting out with some incident light, and two things can happen. So two things can happen. And we're going to use the photon uh, approach here. Uh, uh, consider light as discrete particles for a moment. That photon can be absorbed, like we saw before with those pigments, or it could be scattered, which means it gets to interact with a water molecule or something else. And some of that light is uh, a transmitted straight, straight ahead. So if we um, Take a look, a photon in volume V over a distance delta R here um, has essentially two fates. The photon dies, meaning it's absorbed, converted to heat, or it could be absorbed by a chemical bond which starts to vibrate differently, uh, which is just short of being heat, and or it lives. It could be scattered or it can be transmitted. And in the case of being scattered, it's interacting with a particle or with a molecule of something in the water and it changes direction. And if it's transmitted, there's no interaction at all. So let's do a little accounting of that. So we have our incident light. And if we consider that, you know, the light that's in there, those three things on the right have to add up. It either, the photon is either absorbed, scattered or transmitted. And that's just conservation of energy. So the, the energy coming in has to equal the energy of the fate of the photon. And you can see I'm putting the list of, of equations as we produce them up on the right, the new one will be in the center. So all I did with this equation in the upper right is divide by um, this phi sub i. So if I divide the left side by phi sub i, that's one. And then, so now I've really just got something about the proportion of light that's being absorbed. Uh, we call scattering B for some reason, but that gives you the B for A plus B equals C. And then we have the tran transmitted light with T. So now I've moved that equation up and I've just rearranged. So I take one minus uh, the uh, transmitted light, which gives basically is the proportion of light that's absorbed or we call it attenuance. So one minus the transmitted light is the absorbed light, and that's got to equal the absorbed and scattered light. So this is basically saying, if I'm going to lose photons, they, they're, I'm, I'm either losing them due to absorption or scattering, and that's got to add up. And now I'm just going to give those um, uh, ratios letter names. So I'm going to call this proportion of photons of the proportion of the incident photons that are absorbed, I'm going to call that big A, 
the uh, proportion of photons that were scattered, big B, and the, the total photons that have essentially not been transmitted as C. And there we have big A plus big B equals big C, absorbance plus scatterance equals attenuance. Those are the uh, physics terms, but let's get there. And what you know, physicists like to do and mathematicians like to do is work with essentially uh, incremental volumes, but we wanna know how does this vary perhaps with distance? You know, how, what the particles in the water in one part might be different. So we just work with what we call a differential volume or this small distance delta r. So we've just taken all of those and divided them by the same small distance so that we have the amount of light lost to absorption per distance. So you can imagine if I had one unit of light and I move one meter, I'm gonna lose lose this this many. If I go two meters, I'm going to lose twice as much. And if I go four meters, I'm going to lo lose uh, uh, four times as much, so on. And that's how we get our A plus B equals C. And we make essentially uh, instruments that measure all of these. So let's just review. Um, if the previous math was um, too fast for you, just remember first, A plus B equals C, but more importantly, the total loss of photons per distance, which we call attenuation, is due to absorption and scattering, and they have to add up. So let's look at some instruments that do this. The first is the most simple IOP instrument we have. And remember, an IOP is an inherent optical property. And by inherent optical property, we mean it's a property of the water itself. It's not dependent on the light field. In other words, water molecules exist as one, you know, if you want to think of it, particle, you know, they are one, you know, molecule that light interacts with, phytoplankton or others, sometimes silt or something from a river outflow or, or mud or even macroalgae would be other things that would be interacting. These are all things that are in the water and they don't really depend on the amount of light that's there in terms of their instantaneous measurements. So that's why we call them inherent optical properties. And so we, sell an instrument called the C-STAR, which is called a transmissometer. It's also called a, a beam transmissometer because it uses a beam and it measures beam attenuation, which is also known as beam C and is also known as attenuation. And uh, as you remember, attenuation and transmission are really the same thing. If you remember, attenuation was really just one minus transmission. So how does this instrument work? There's an LED source which creates a ray that's just about proportionally about that, that wide, a ray of light. It's not a laser, it's just a red LED diode. You can get different colors too if you wanna look at different wavelengths of attenuation. But we're just, just like the um, picture before, we're looking at the how much of light is of the incident light makes it to the receiver window. And we make two different lengths, one which is 25 centimeters and one which is 10. And I'll explain the difference later on. So let's again, let's just look at this in terms of what we had before. Um, we have an LED source and a detector. And here we can see sort of the physical makeup. Again, we have an LED source and a lens at the other end and a photodiode detector at the end. And Let's take a look at this now in terms of our Greek letters. Our LED source is the incident light, the amount of light that's uh, been absorbed along this 25 or 10 centimeter path is the absorbed light. Some of it is scattered out of the beam and never makes it to the detector. And what the detector measures is that transmitted light. So what this, this um, 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 instrument measures is essentially the loss of light due to absorption scattering. So that's why we call it a transmissometer because, well, we call it a transmissometer because it's measuring how much light is transmitted here, but equivalently, the actual quantity it measures is attenuation. Now, let's say we want to use this in a flow through system on a ship where we can't put submerge the instrument in water or we want to use it in a laboratory to measure, let's say, uh, a microcosm or a, some sort of biological entity where the water is being pumped. 
So we're going to put in a tube. And so what do we need to make this work so that those scattered photons don't become, don't go to the detector? Because with the, without the scattering tube, they, they would be lost, correct? So um, what we're going to do is simply just coat that tube with a black coating so that any photon that's scattered out of the path within a couple degree, within a, about a degree, is actually absorbed by that black tube. And that's the equivalent of it escaping. So the only light that's going to make it there are the photons that are neither scattered or absorbed. And there's just a little bit of scattering because this has a finite aperture. So about, it can, it will detect light that's been scattered up to about a degree, but anything more than that will be, um, will be um, reflected into the side of the tube and then absorbed. So that's how we can measure C with, with this. So those rays essentially get absorbed. So again, we have A plus B equals C. Uh, it turns out in terms of the math, the transmission of light, which is again, the proportion of photons that do make it through the volume is related to distance exponentially. And so how we compute this is we compute the transmission and we take the log of that and divide by R. Here's another beam transmissometer. It works exactly the same way. It's called a C rover. And again, its design is made for uh, Argo floats and they're deployed on some bio Argo floats in, um, in, in the oceans. And here is one of those sea rovers. Uh, this is a solid model rendering of a uh, Argo float made by NKE, a French company. And you can see th that the sea rover is mounted on the side here. Let's look at some data. So what we're looking at in these panels in the vertical axis is depth. So these are depth profiles. And on the left, let's just take a look at you know, normal CTD data. So the red line is temperature, and we can see that it's warm at the surface around 22.5 degrees and drops to about 14 degrees C as we essentially cross this thermocline at about, I don't know, 50 to 70 meters. And then it stays fairly constant the rest of the way through, but getting a little bit colder. Likewise with salinity, it's a little bit, uh, in this particular case, the salinity maximum is at about 300 uh, meters and um, um, stays relatively constant after that. Um, now let's take a look at the beam attenuation. So again, this is how much light is attenuated per unit of distance. And we can see right near the surface, about, th about 30, 40 meters, we see a lot of light being lost or more light being lost than in other points. And you can see that there's a fairly complex set of layers of absorption here. Most likely this is, even though I don't have a fluorometer here, most likely this is due to phytoplankton uh, subsurface chlorophyll maximum. And uh, further down, this could be essentially um, what was often called the twilight zone, essentially uh, decaying uh, and sinking phytoplankton and particles. What's important about attenuation and just about any measurement is when you measure it all over the world, you can start learning things about the biogeochemistry of the ocean. And since the part of what's happening is we're both losing photons due to absorption of things like phytoplankton and scattering due to both phytoplankton and other particles, um, people thought, well, let's see, in the open ocean, we don't have much mineral particles when we're away from the influence of rivers. So what we have is what's called POC or particulate organic carbon. And they, since carbon is really the currency of climate change now, people wanted to say, well, is there a relationship between this attenuation of light and uh, separate measurements that we can make in the laboratory of particulate organic carbon? And that way we can leverage an instrument that we can deploy almost everywhere and not have to do all of these laboratory measurements. And we can see for the large part, and notice this is a linear scale, it's not a logarithmic scale. That's a pretty good correlation. There are some different, different experiments that have taken place, but to the first order, there's a very positive correlation between the attenuation of light and the amount of particulate matter. So more particulate matter, more absorption, I mean, more attenuation. 
So let's say we want to, so we've taken a look at C. Another thing with, that we can do is how can we make an absorption meter? We're only measuring the A part. So here's our beam transmissometer again, our LED source, which is the incident light. Some light is being scattered and some light is being absorbed and a certain amount is only making the detector. But in this case, we want to measure the scattered light and meaning we want it to essentially um, be counted in, and <clears throat> either make it through multiple scattering events to the detector or finally be absorbed. And so what we do is we create a different flow tube. And what we do is we put a silver lining literally on this tube and the light essentially bounces around in the tube until it either is absorbed or makes it to the detector. So in that case, we're only measuring the loss of photons due to absorption. So again, we have a silver, silver coating on the inside of the C tube and it scatters photons back into the beam and the scattered photons are either absorbed or they're transmitted to the detector. So we're measuring the loss of photons due to absorption only. There's another view of this, again, using uh, a light source where we shine a beam into the water and it's just a, uh, you can see that there is a, this is not a perfect uh, system, but um, it works really well. And we can make some corrections for the imperfections of this as part of the correct post deployment corrections. So what if we put that, a now absorption meter back to back with an attenuation meter. So we're measuring C as we, with the beam transmissometer, we're measuring it with the black blackened tube, and then we're measuring absorption with the silver tube. We've got A and C, we can get scattering by difference because A plus B equals C, right? So C minus A equals B. And uh, we don't actually sell this, <laughs> this instrument, but what we do sell is an instrument that measures this at 80 different wavelengths where we have the A2, which is the silvered one, and the C2, which is the blackened one, two lights, or, or it's actually one light source. And inside we've got a spinning filter that gives us the 80 different wavelengths. So we measure the light again for um, the loss of light due to attenuation in the C tube and the loss of light only due to absorption in the A tube. With this data set, now we have more like the Crayola 80 pack of colors, and we can do this wavelength by wavelength, take the difference between C and A and get scattering at every one of those wavelengths. Um, the way this is implemented, and I didn't don't have a picture of this, but I'm gonna <laughs> sort of draw it here as I move my mouse around. There's actually a spinning filter here that in, uh, consists of two, portions of the spectrum, uh, probably about 400 to 600 and then 600 to 800. <clears throat> and these are these linear variable filters. So as it spins around, you can imagine uh, the light is uh, uh, um, tracing an arc through this linear variable filter. Um, we have recently updated this uh, instrument to include a new LED light source as opposed to an incandescent LED. And one of the nice things about that light source is it lasts a long time, 10,000 hours. So that means less service trips back to uh, Seabird. But more importantly, from a science point of view, it's got a much better, it's much more sensitive in the blue region. And here we're showing the old here with the black and the new with the red, it's sensitivity in the blue. It's able to essentially capture the true spectrum of absorption, mostly due to phytoplankton here, as opposed to this compromised one, which is less sensitive uh, due to the basically less blue light in an incandescent light, which we're all familiar with. This particular set of measurements was done on a research sailing ship um, and it's traveled all over the world. Um, in this particular case, 187 days measuring continuously from North Europe to Antarctica. And you can see the ACS um, mounted in the, or actually there's two ACS in there, one with the 
uh, LED light source and one with the incandescent light source in a, in a box. So since we were talking about scattering, um, what about, uh, what's a simple um, inherent optical property that we can measure that's related to total scattering is backscattering. And here, what we're just showing is a particle here with it's just a white dot and light interacting in it. And it could scatter in all possible directions. And it turns out for the most part, a lot of the light is scattered in the forward direction, um, directly in the forward direction, a little bit less so to the sides, and then a good proportion of it almost literally to the back. And so if we take a sum of all the light that's scattered from essentially draw a vertical line here and essentially this semicircle of this hemisphere, we measure all the light that's going into that reverse hemisphere, we call that backscattering. And if I look at this in terms of how we think about it in the ocean, let's orient the ocean surface here and we have a particle the light that a uh, satellite sees or you see from a ship or from, from the coast when you look at the ocean is backscattered light. So if we can get a handle on this backscattering, then we have, again, an idea of how light is interacting with the water. If you imagine a lot of these particles, a lot of light is gonna be backscattered. We're familiar with that with, let's say a river outflows during the spring and a lot of, uh, silt, and we see, you know, very big white plumes like the Fraser River outflow from in near uh, Vancouver, Canada. And um, this is also the light that's scattered up to an ocean color satellite. So what if we design a sensor that has a source on the right, has a detector on the left, and we point them at an angle that intersects so that we get essentially light at roughly one, but a, a range of angles. And what we're looking here is kind of just one slice through that volume, but you can imagine this trapezoidal volume in 3D, that's where all the light is interacting. And what we're trying to do is measure, in this case, we're not trying to measure all the backscattered light, we're trying to get it at roughly one angle. And it turns out, if you can measure it at one backscattering angle, there's a very simple conversion factor, and it's just an empirical result that says I can convert that into the total backscattered light. A really powerful result, and it's not immediately obvious, and it took people years to figure it out, but it's very simple. There we go. I just lost my headset there for a minute. Nicole, can you confirm I'm back on? Yep, we can hear you. Good. So this is the theory behind this instrument. Now, what's very interesting is, remember we talked about the relationship between uh, attenuation and particulate organic carbon? Well, there's another one for here for backscattering, and it's not surprising. This is how light is interacting with particles. And it turns out this backscattering meter at 700 nanometers, which is in the red, has a very also a very nice correlation with respect to particulate organic carbon. And this is actually a much smaller and less exp essentially less expensive sensor. So um, um, that's a very important uh, result. And we'll go over essentially what instruments the backscattering meter is available in in a, in a few minutes. The other measurement that's available in our ECO sensor is uh, a, a number of fluorometers, the most important, which is measuring uh, chlorophyll, or as I've said here, measuring biology. And so what is chlorophyll fluorescence? Well, if we take some spinach and we put it in some solvent and extract that chlorophyll pigment, which we expect to be green, you can see it in this little um, cup here, clear cup, and we shine, in this case, it's an ultraviolet light, but it's, it's really almost just a violet light. You can see that the light that's being, uh, that we're seeing here is red. And this isn't reflected light, because remember, this is an ultraviolet light. There's no red in the light. What we're seeing is the emission of red photons. 
So we, we've taken an LED, let's say, or a light that's in the violet or blue around 470 nanometers, and we call that the excitation wavelength. And the actual emission by the chlorophyll molecules is at 685 to 700 nanometers. So how does that work? This is what's called a Jablansky diagram. Don't get too worried about it. But what we're seeing here are the energy levels in a molecule. That's all these horizontal lines are. And there's a ground state, which is the ground state, meaning the, just the normal state. And what happens is when light comes along, that light is absorbed. And that starts essentially the, the, the atoms starting to be vibrated, but there are discrete wavelengths. And what we've turned, taken on the side here is we've taken that chlorophyll absorption curve and we've turned it sideways. So here's wavelength, here's the amount of absorption and we can see that at some energy levels, like around 420 or 12, 450 nanometers, actually, we're absorbing more light than at a bunch of others. And then also right around 680 nanometers, we're also absorbing light. So we have these two sets of conditions, and this is just because of the chlorophyll molecule, how it's designed or how it's arranged and how the different um, things that make up the molecule, this is again, the miracle of photosynthesis that it has these absorption bands. And what happens is some of that energy goes into of course photosynthesis, but some of those photons just don't, aren't used by photosynthesis. And what happens is they drop back down to the ground state. And that's what fluorescence is. It's, it happens immediately. There's no, essentially time, no, I can't say that there's no time lapse, but essentially it's within somewhere between millisecond, picoseconds and milliseconds. And it depends a little bit on where you are and some of the different paths that it can take. You can see that there's a different path that it can take through here to get to fluorescence. But essentially this is, uh, happens uh, in terms of the way we perceive it immediately. So as you can see, there are some slightly different um, absorption bands here, which give rise to the width of this absorption band. And likewise here are different energy levels that give rise to this. It's not just one you know, discrete energy level, it's a range of them, but that's what's causing that fluorescence. And notice that we've lost energy, right? Here we have some blue light and when it fluoresces, the energy level is much lower, it's red. And that's true of any, any almost 99.9% .9 of the time when, an, when a molecule is absorbed by, uh, uh, when, when, when a photon is absorbed by a mo molecule, it's, it's energy, um, the, the wavelength of the fluorescence emission is, is longer, meaning less energy in the photon. So here's a very simple equation about fluorescence. Basically says, I take a certain amount of light, I absorb that light, and then I, I convert it to a different wavelength. And it literally is that product. So how do we get to a fluorometer? Well, what we're gonna say is let's take that absorption curve and let's just normalize it by chlorophyll A. And the int intuition there is that if we have twice as much chlorophyll A, we're gonna have twice as much absorption. So if this were one unit of chlorophyll, we'd have this amount of absorption, twice as much chlorophyll, we'd have twice as much. And that's true. You know, if you have twice as much pigment in your molecule, twice as much pigment probably means you've got twice the amount of chlorophyll, uh, you'll have twice as much absorption. So we can see that these terms, this A star and these are properties of the phytoplankton itself or the phytoplankton community. So what we consider them is a constant. And then we also control the light with an LED. So essentially we've got a set of constants multiplied by chlorophyll. So our fluorescence is really just a constant times chlorophyll A. And we can characterize E, A star, and this phi sub F as part of our calibration. So you measure fluorescence, we give you a calibration constant, you get chlorophyll out. And that is the theory behind a chlorophyll ferometer. Um, the, the equivalent of uh, in the ocean of tea, where we have uh, material that's dissolved as opposed to particulate, it's called fluorescent dissolved organic matter, which is a subset of 
colored dissolved organic matter, which is in terms of subset of dissolved organic carbon, which is in turn a subset of dissolved organic matter. And so to the first order, FDOM ends up being a proxy for certain biological processes. It varies as to the part of the ocean, whether you can use fluorescent dissolved organic matter as a proxy for dissolved organic matter, but you can see that there is a relationship between the two. And so if we look at here, what we're looking at is what's called an excitation emission matrix. If we were to take, uh, essentially scan uh, a light and at every, at every wavelength, we measure what the emission looks like, we end up with a three-dimensional map. And our, chlor our CDOM fluorometers essentially measure at one point, which is about at 370 coming in here and 460 coming in here. And we measure right about here. Obviously this is dependent on the kind of uh, um, uh, dissolved organic material. It does vary from different parts of the ocean. Um, but even just measuring again, consistently across the world's oceans with one excitation emission pair means that we can develop some interesting understanding of the ocean with respect to essentially the fate of phytoplankton after their, essentially their guts spill out after they're eaten by, by um, microzooplankton or zooplankton. Um, how do the fluorometer work? Well, we just, again, shine, just like with a scattering meter, we shine, in this case, a blue light in one direction, and we sh uh, measure the scattered light. Fluorescence emission goes in all directions, so we're sort of guaranteed to get some of that fluorescence by viewing it at the same angle that we were looking at scattering. And here is a depth profile fluorescence from a number of different fluorometers. In this particular case, we're looking at an ecofluorometer that um, has two chlorophyll fluorometers, one which excites light in the violet at 435 nanometers and one which excites light at 470 nanometers. And they detect light at the same wavelength, 695. There's also a backscattering meter uh, that's part of this. So we can do chlorophyll and backscattering. And you can see this is a, a, a set of chlorophyll fluorometers, about one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And when we put them in the water, we really hope after calibration that they all agree. And they do with the, small, with the exception of the uh, at depth profile of a third party instrument. This is not a con uh, comment on, on that instrument. It just, it just, so happens in this particular data set, that one had a bias with depth. The other thing we can do if we were measuring at two wavelengths is we can take the ratio of those. And since different pigments absorb different, since pigments absorb dif differently at let's say 435 nanometers versus 470, we can take the ratio of that fluorescence and they can tell us something about the phytoplankton community. In this particular case, there was a paper about um, a species called Noctiluca, which can be an essentially a, a, a problem species for water bodies in the Arabian Sea. And we can detect some of the changes in the phytoplankton community over time on the bottom. These are days uh, by just taking the ratio of the two fluorometers. I'm gonna finish up here with radiometry. Again, what we're trying to do here is measure light that's coming out of the ocean and ideally, we'd like to measure light. If you think of a hemisphere, kind of like a planetarium, we would like to measure the light from everywhere. So if you think of this as one of the, uh, half of one of those 360 degree cameras uh, pointing up at the sky, you can see some clouds and the sun behind the cloud. If we look at that in terms of the actual um, energy in that light, can see in the dark spots, there's less energy and in the bright spots, there's more energy. Ideally, we would have um, an instrument that measures that. Um, that's actually a really hard instrument to make. So instead, what we do is we take a measurement called a radiance and imagine the light, let's say sunlight coming down. What we're going to do is integrate over this entire upper hemisphere, all the light. And we're gonna count essentially all of those photons or, or count all of that stuff. And, all, all of that radiation, 
Or what we're gonna do is just look at one very small section of the sphere, and that's what we call radiance. And it depends on where and how we point the instrument. Often we point it either directly up or directly down, but you could imagine that if you took a whole bunch of measurements at different points in a sphere, you could come up with a measurement of that sphere, of, of that points all along that hemisphere. And so that is essentially what's called downwelling light. When we point the instrument up, we're measuring the hemisphere of light that um, is coming down. So that's downwelling irradiance. If we just simply invert the instrument, we can measure upwelling light. So all I did was turn these pictures upside down. So what does that look like in the water? Well, since, since you know, every extra, every doubling of distance, uh, we get a, um, a, you know, a, a doubling of the loss of light. We can, the, the, the essentially the equation for um, the irradiance, sorry about that, irradiance uh, changing with depth is an exponential relationship. And we can see that some interesting things. Here we're looking at light underneath the ice. And so there's an ice, a uh, layer of ice at the top. And what we see is actually light is increasing. And it turns out that the ice initially shades the light in, in that downwelling hemisphere. But as soon as we get down past about five or 10 meters, we see the traditional drop off of light. So you can see sometimes some very unusual phenomena, and this can tell us a lot about the ice where this uh, maximum is. We sell, um, as I said, three different instruments that measure light, uh, one at four wavelengths, one at seven wavelengths, and one at 140 wavelengths, and that's our hyper OCR. So in summary, we uh, provide the tools for oceanographers to understand light and water. Our instruments measure important proxies for biogeochemical pro processes, as we talked about particulate organic carbon, phytoplankton biomass, and so on. And our instruments put that A plus B equals C and fluorescence theory into practice. Ready for questions? All right, thank you, Eric. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and type them into the Q&A and we will start working on them. All right, it looks like our first question, could you show the equation for the fluorometer again? Now, this is the final equation. Again, what we control in the fluorometer is we control the light source, so that's known. What we've done is, you know, hundreds and thousands of measurements, but more importantly, we've, we, we've just uh, picked, a, in our particular case, we picked a standard species of phytoplankton, and we used a separate method to determine chlorophyll A, either spectrophotometrically or using a, a, a laboratory fluorometer or using what's called high performance liquid chromatography. And we came up with that K without even necessarily measuring the actual energy of the light bulb or knowing these things. But from first principles, this is, this is why it works. It's because in general, in broad principles, and remember this varies this is this, the, these things can vary physiologically. They can vary based on species, the, but the broad idea is that the absorption due to phytoplankton at a particular wavelength, when average a lot across a lot of species, and their ability to convert incident photons into fluorescence is broadly constant. We have the light that's constant, so the only thing that can be changing to change the fluorescence is chlorophyll A. Now, in practice. What happens is different species have slightly different abilities to turn light into fluorescence based on both their physiology as well as their nutrition, nutrient status and stuff like that. As we noticed, um, different phytoplankton have different absorption spectra because they have different pigments that can change a little bit. So um, chlorof estimating chlorophyll from fluorescence is an imperfect science. 
But the power is that we can deploy this simple instrument in many, 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 many places. So a imperfect measurement measured a lot is better than a perfect measurement not measured very much. All right, and the next question from Sharon, when we send chlorophyll fluorometers for calibration, what is done to generate the calibration coefficients and why do they change over time with the instruments used? Okay. Um, so why would they change? Well, what if the LED output changed over time? That would be one thing. In general, fluorometers are very stable. The other thing that can happen is the output of the light is slightly temperature dependent, and we are working on corrections for that, particularly when we're talking about instead of chlorophyll fluorescent dissolved organic matter, because we use an ultraviolet LED in that case, and it's a little bit more temperature uh, dependent. But I think if you have a chlorophyll ferometer and you've calibrated it more than once, take a look at the calibration coefficients across the last however many times you do it. I don't think you'll see a whole lot of change between them. Now, of course, um, if the instrument has had some physical jarring. You know, the um, angles of the source and detector could have changed just very slightly. That's part of calibration. It doesn't mean that the instrument is non-functional, but it doesn't take much to uh, change um, the alignment. Now our eco-fluorometers, almost all of the um, detector and um, LED parts are encased in epoxy. So there's very little damage that you can do to that. That's probably an imperfect, it's an imperfect uh, answer to that question. Um, but um, there we are. Excellent. Um, our next question is, do you have an example for how the new ACS-9 can be used? I understand that these data can be difficult to interpret for the average user. This is true, and I agree with you. One of the things that we can take a look at here, and we were just talking about how we're not sure if our fluorometer is calibrated, there are some very good well-known relationships, for example, between absorption at about 412 nanometers. Look for the work of Andre Morel, M-O-R-E-L, <clears throat> that empirical relationships between absorption at 412. I realize that's only one out of the 80 wavelengths, but it's a very powerful relationship. Um, we can also take a look at aspects of the phytoplankton community. We know, we know that certain phytoplankton, if they're very large and the way the pigments are packaged, this, this mountain here of absorption gets flattened out. Uh, whereas when you have smaller phytoplankton, even with the same concentration of chlorophyll, this becomes more peaked. So taking a look at some of the aspects of this spectrum can tell us, especially if we look over time, at the changes in the relative um, composition of the community. Secondly, we can take a look at, if you're familiar at all with differential calculus, you can take the derivative, second, third, fourth, fifth derivatives of this curve, and you can begin to find the little wiggles in here that have to do with the individual pigments. And if you can find those individual pigments, you can sometimes get down to genus or even species level. So yes, it's a sophisticated instrument for sophisticated results, but some very simple things like simply looking at absorption at 412 nanometers can give you a check on your chlorophyll number that you got from your fluorometer. All right, and it looks like we're just heading over the hour now, so I'm gonna do one more question. Um, how much uncertainty comes from the ambient light correction? Is it something that needs to be considered or not? Um. Okay, this is a really, really good question. Let's talk about it just with respect to one instrument, the ECO. The ECO actually, you, you, if, if you take out your slow motion camera, it's actually blinking on and off at about a thousand Hertz or a thousand times a second. And when it's on the diode is measuring, the photodiode is measuring, and when it's off the photodiode is measuring. The only thing that can be happening when the LED is off and we measure something with, with the photodiode off must be ambient light. So we actually 
subtract the ambient light by using that method of modulating the, uh, the LED at a thousand Hertz. When it's on, we get ambient light plus the fluorescence of the water. When the LED is off, there's no fluorescence. We just have ambient light, take the difference and we only have fluorescence. So that's how ambient light is in general rejected in all of our equipment is that we turn that light on and off and we know when it's on and when it's off. And internally we do that sub subtraction. It's not available to you. It's done in actually in hardware. Well, depends on the instrument. Sometimes in hardware, sometimes in firmware, but it's not, it's, a, it's something we do for you. It is possible to overwhelm an instrument. If you point, point it up at the sky, it's possible that you can saturate the instrument. Not harm it, but just saturate it. All right, in the interest of time, I think we will call it. And for those of you who ask questions that we didn't get to, um, we will be able to get back to you. Feel free to contact us after the webinar if you have any other questions. And if you have a minute, please take our survey at the end of this. So thank you, Eric, and thank you everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you for attending. And I will be sure to get to those questions. Um, I'll get these questions answered to you, the ones that I wasn't able to get to in the group. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.